morning, ladies and gentlemen, to this, the first ITU symposium on the Future Network Car. Now, I know many of you have been participating in similar events here in previous years at the Geneva Motor Show, which were titled the Fully Network Car. But for 2014, we've revamped it. As you can see, it's a different uh, program this time. In particular, we want to focus on the future. That's why we changed the name. And also, we have, for the first morning, two high-level sessions bringing together key stakeholders from the industry and other players to discuss how we can all work together to bring the benefits of the intelligent transport systems to the citizens of the world, and in particular, to uh, reduce the deaths and injuries on the roads today. And there are many obstacles uh, to be addressed, which we hope to do so over uh, these two days. And uh, let me first of all uh, thank our partner in organizing this event, the UNECE, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, and particularly uh, the director of the transport division, Eva Molna, uh, for being with us uh, this morning. As uh, many of you know, uh, UNECE uh, is the organization responsible for the primary international uh, treaty relevant to uh, this field, the Vienna Convention on Road Traffic. And I would also like to thank uh, uh, AB InBev, uh, our sponsor for this event this year. And uh, that sponsorship has allowed us to uh, have the event uh, televised to bring it uh, to a much wider audience than in previous years. And also, of course, um, I'd like to thank uh, Infinity Motor Company for being with us and for having this uh, beautiful car here in front of us, which has all the latest uh, state-of-art uh, technology in it. And I'm sure we'll look forward to having a close look at that during the, uh, the coffee breaks. And uh, last but not least, of course, uh, I would like to thank uh, the Geneva International Motor Show uh, for once again uh, hosting this event uh, at the, um, one of the leading uh, motor show events in the world. Uh, I believe this is uh, eight or nine years now we've been running this event. So our aim uh, over these two days is to finish uh, tomorrow with some clear ideas on the way forward, uh, some concrete actions that we can take um, to set us on the right path for achieving uh, the vision of the future network car. Uh, there are incredible innovations which we will hear about, in particular in the technical sessions starting after lunch, and uh, of course the opportunities for the automated driving uh, and uh, intelligent transport systems uh, for the future. Uh, many of you uh, may be new to ITU um, and uh, may not be aware that uh, we now have a very clear objective to bring together the ICT uh, sector players together with the transportation sector. And uh, last year, um, Every year, we have a World Telecommunications and Informa Information Society Day. And last year, we had the theme of uh, ICTs and improving road safety. Uh, we were very proud to have the Formula One driver, Philippe Massa, uh, there demonstrating live um, the dangers of uh, texting whilst driving. It's quite a frightening experience to see that. Uh, we had three laureates honored in recognition of their leadership and dedication to uh, promoting ICTs as a means of improving road safety. We had Mr. Yuli Mauer, president of the Swiss uh, Confederation, Mr. Volker Denner, uh, the uh, chairman of the board of uh, Bosch, and uh, Jean Todd president of the Federal International uh, Association, Automobile uh, Federation. 
So um, we were very pleased uh, that um, uh, John uh, is with us again uh, for this event. Thank you very much, John, for joining us. And uh, I'd like to mention that um, we're also moving forward in this area by having an event, an interoperability event uh, hosted at the Geneva uh, headquarters of the ITU. In, in May, we will bring together um, car manufacturers together with uh, makers of hand-free uh, terminals and phones to test their products against uh, ITU standards to ensure th that um, they do interoperate and they do meet uh, the standards. And we want to build uh, on uh, partnerships in this area, key partnerships such as FIA, UNECE, but also uh, the very many other players in this area, and in particular, of course, um, the car manufacturers. Car manufacturers don't have uh, the tradition of uh, working uh, within ITU, and so this is a challenge that we're facing, is to, to bring together the car manufacturers and the ICT um, companies to work together in uh, addressing these, um, these uh, challenges. It's been estimated that uh, ITS uh, could reduce road traffic accidents by as much as 80%. And uh, when we talk about uh, the deaths on the road each year totaling 1.3 million and uh, 20 to 50 million uh, people being injured on the roads every year, if you can reduce that by 80%, then, of course, we're saving millions uh, or thousands, at least, of lives every, every year. And autonomous driving uh, offers uh, even greater potential to reduce these numbers. So to try and bring together um, all the various players, um, we have uh, established in ITU what we call um, a collaboration on ITS communication standards. And this is an open group, open to any uh, interested party. Uh, we have uh, many uh, other standards bodies uh, participating. We have technology solution providers uh, participating in the group. And I'm pleased to say uh, we're now uh, seeing uh, car manufacturers uh, joining uh, this group. Besides, uh, <clears throat> of course, the benefits of reducing um, accidents and deaths on the road, uh, one of the themes that we've been looking at in previous events here is uh, how intelligent transport systems can reduce traffic congestion and by doing so reduce pollution and therefore also help to combat climate change. So there are two very important uh, elements uh, to this discussion we have today. I'm pleased to say that the UN Secretary General has uh, recognize the work we're doing in ITU and commended ITU for its work in this area. We need to work with all players and we hope that uh, this event uh, this week will bring together all the key stakeholders. We look forward to having some clear actions coming out of this tomorrow on how we can take the work forward. I'd like to thank uh, all the moderators and uh, all the very expert speakers we have uh, joining us for this uh, event. And I wish you all a very interesting and productive uh, two days. So I'll now hand over to Laura. Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Thanks for all of you who are able to attend. I'll start by just introducing our panelists. Uh, as Malcolm mentioned, we have Eva Molnar. Uh, she's a director for the Transport Division of the UN Economic Commission for Europe. Obviously, Malcolm Johnson. Uh, director of the Telecommunications Standards Bureau at ITU. We have Jean Todd, the President of the FIA, International Federation of Automobiles, and Scott Ratson, the Global Vice President uh, for Global Corporate Affairs at AB InBev. Malcolm mentioned some of the statistics that I think help bring everyone together around a conversation about road safety. And Jean, I wonder if you would start our conversation by helping us appreciate why this is such an ascendant issue in the global dialogue these days. We're seeing staggering numbers. We're seeing tremendous coverage in the popular press. Um, it'd be great to hear your perspective on the, the urgency that you're seeing around the issue. Well, I mean, 
Thank you for that and good evening, uh, everybody. I'm delighted to be part of this uh, panel to speak about uh, connectivity, road safety, and uh, to see how it can be addressed. Because as uh, you rightly mentioned, I mean, road accident is one of the worst scourge in our society. And um, we feel it's not yet properly addressed. As other as scourges has been addressed, like malaria, HIV, uh, AIDS, or tuberculosis. And um, it's a big killer. It was just mentioned, 1.3 million people die on the road last year. About 50 million people were injured. And uh, at the actual trend, by 2020, it will be 2 million people who will die on the roads and 80 million people who will be injured. So it's really time to act very strongly. And I'm very delighted to have uh, people like uh, Eva, like Scott, like very strong-minded people who have decided to address. Incidentally, you were talking about the UNSG was decided the decade of action 2011-2020 with a very strong aims. And um, actions have to be undertaken at all the level as it has been on other scourges. I mean, we are in Geneva. In Geneva, you have the headquarters of UNAIDS, where a lot have been done and a lot have been achieved. And uh, I really feel that uh, it's a mandate we have to lead that with other strong players, like WHO, which is also based in Geneva, the World Bank, the regional banks, and to have also commercial companies to join this movement to create a big structure in order to address properly the problem. And then we can get into what are the means. You know, it's education, it's law enforcement, it's road infrastructure, and it's the vehicles. And here we are in the Geneva Motor Show where we see amazing vehicles, amazing technologies, but unfortunately, everybody has not access to all those cars and to all those technologies. Great. Thank you. Well, Scott, as a representative from the private sector, I wonder if you'd elaborate on Jean's point in terms of the role of the private sector in addition to the various UN agencies and policymakers on road safety. Thank you, Laura. And um, I'm very happy to be here at the Geneva Car Show with all of you. And on behalf of AB InBev, we're dedicated to bringing people together for a better world. And in doing that, we need to address some of the key issues, such as road safety, in making the world a better place for all of us. Uh, I'm trained as a public health physician at the world's largest brewer. And when I joined this company, I looked at the issues that are facing us in the world. And Jean taught very well said, HIV in the beginning of, of UN age, which wasn't here 30 years ago without uh, a virus to tackle. But what we have seen over the years, and when you really look at the numbers that we've heard, not only from Malcolm of the 1.3 million people, if the numbers are right today, and the eighth leading cause of death in the world, uh, which is leading to road safety, to grow, as Jean Todd said, to maybe the fifth leading cause of death if we don't do anything about it, it's clear that we need to have a multi-sectoral partnership to make a difference here. And I'm, I'm very proud to be with the two leading UN agencies here today that are looking at this issue and what are some of the ways that we could help the world to actually deal with both the risks we have, but also solutions. The piece that's really troubling is it's not just deaths in large numbers, but it's deaths at an early stage of life. 15 to 29 year olds are the, num the number one leading cause of death for 15 and 29 year olds is road safety. So as a father with two boys that are just ready to enter that age group, it's not just when they're behind the wheels of a car or a passenger in a car, but it's when they're walking to school, when they're riding a bus, it's when they're riding a bike, and hopefully at least not my children, not on a motorbike, but they're vulnerable road drivers, vulnerable people at that age group. So what we're trying to do with AB and Bev, and we've been pleased that we've been able to support both strong sessions in, in Davos with, with Jean Tott and UN Secretary General's office, number of leading companies, the World Bank and others, uh, to look at the issue from a multi-sectoral standpoint and to begin to develop the kind of partnership that we think will be important 
in, um, in addressing this. And I'm, I'm proud to hear both the work that, that um, Laura quickly mentioned with FSG. Uh, it's been quite engaged in looking at the issue, not only holistically from an epidemiological or number standpoint, but also what are the solutions that we can find by having expert interviews, by engaging with people such as many of you around the room here uh, to try to come up with the solutions that we might need to address the scourge. Great, and many of the solutions I think, Malcolm, you alluded to. It would be great to hear for a few minutes how you come out in the net net of technology as, as a force for good in terms of safety, but it's also been talked about as, as a risk factor in and of its own self. Yes, um, well, that, that is a, a, a very important point because uh, I believe statistics show that around 80% of accidents are due to driver distraction. Um, and that was uh, recognized uh, by the ITU um, two years ago when we adopted a, a resolution where ITU should take a specific action to reduce uh, driver distraction because this driver dist distraction is mainly due to the use of uh, phones whilst driving or even texting. This is why we had this uh, demonstration by Philip Messer I mentioned. Uh, and so this is a, a primary aim, is to recognize that, uh, in fact, uh, our technology is causing uh, a lot of accidents. And what we need to do is to make sure that um, uh, we provide a very efficient, effective, and good quality, hands-free environment in the car, which is why we are, um, we are very pleased to be organizing the first of these uh, events in, in May, bringing together uh, car manufacturers and also the, the manufacturers of these products, the phones and, and devices for in-car entertainment, etc., to make sure that uh, the driver can utilize all, all these uh, facilities without being distracted from driving the car. Um, so we're very, very pleased about that. The, uh, another, uh, as John Todd mentioned, um, there is the Decade of Action um, 20, uh, uh, 11 to 2020, which the UN adopted with the aim of reducing uh, deaths on the roads by uh, 5 million uh, over, the, over that decade. Um, and uh, another uh, statistic which is, is very interesting is that um, around 92% uh, of these accidents occur in middle or low income countries. So the developing world even though uh, they have approximately only 50% of the cars on the roads. So it's a very high proportion of the accidents are in the developing world. And of course, the ITU being a UN agency, uh, the majority of our member states are developing countries. And uh, this is another reason why there's so much attention placed on this in the ITU and why uh, we want to bring the benefits of this technology uh, to uh, all people, especially in the developing countries, to reduce these, uh, these terrible statistics, but at the same time letting drivers benefit from the, the technology in a safe way. And some of those technologies are quite exciting, right? Autonomous driving and the networked cars, they do present challenges to our regulatory frameworks. And Eva, I wonder if you could comment on how you're seeing regulatory agencies starting to grapple with this. Well, the challenges uh, start with the fact that we have motorized road transportation. Motorized road transportation has introduced a lot of good things. First of all, it introduced opportunities for people to be able to change their workplace more freely than in the past because the distance they can cover uh, on a daily basis is bigger. So it's more freedom. It's more freedom uh, and so to go to a theater and, and, uh, and uh, to meet your friends. So motorized transport has a lot of positive impacts, but there are a number of negative impacts. Safety is one of them. I will not discuss the other negative impacts like congestion, environmental pollution, uh, including noise, etc. Let's talk about safety. Safety is one of the negative problems. And uh, <clears throat> ever since there has been a car, even before it was motorized, safety was an issue. Uh, but uh, with the increased speed and with the increased traffic, it's becoming a real war to save lives. Um, in this war, uh, the very first uh, perhaps big achievement was uh, that soon after 
motor cars appeared on the streets, some regulations were introduced. And actually it was uh, at that time FIA that initiated and uh, the predecessor of the UN uh, dealt with that. And later on it was followed up. So you had to introduce some order into the system. But despite all, all of these efforts, I should say that safety has not improved too much over the years. There are improvements in some parts of the world, in the developed world. There are improvements through technology in certain um, uh, areas, but the big picture is not improving. Global road safety is still a big challenge. Although in the past, you know, we had a very simple approach, focus on prevention. Prevention means focus on vehicle infrastructure and the human factor. And there were results. The World Bank had a very interesting study about the Central European countries in the 90s who had to witness the motorization um, um, increase uh, in a couple of years compared to the other countries in the West who had to have that in 30, 40 years. So the, uh, the recommendations were on these three pillars and the results were there. And then we said it's not enough globally. We have to have a more holistic approach, very rightly. And now what you see, there is a very interesting correlation. The countries that don't have proper regulatory framework for road safety are the worst performance with regard to safety. So it's important to come back to these basics, prevention, prevention. Of course, we need to ha have post-crash approach. We have to have trauma care. Improvement is very low in that area. The health sector is not reforming itself enough at the right speed. Uh, but uh, we have problems with the insurance as well. Insurance companies are not um, giving the best service all over the world. They are very good in the Western, in, in the high developed countries, but not in the developing countries. However, regulations. Countries that have not signed up, for example, for the Vienna Conventions, Vienna Convention on Road Signs and Signals and Vienna Convention on Traffic Signs, uh, countries that have not signed up for the vehicle regulations of 58 and 98, they are the worst safety performance. The, the regulatory framework with proper political will by the government is needed. And, and you point out so many of the complexities which suggest that no one actor can fix this problem in any in any particular country, and hence the importance of, of all the partnerships that Jean Todd was mentioning. And Jean Todd, I wonder if you will comment about some of the global frameworks that are helping organize these partnerships, like the Global Road Safety Partnership and others that you're a part of, to help illustrate how many actors are coming together to help manage some of that complexity. I mean, as it was said before, the good thing is that the road safety situation starts to be addressed and I mean it's creating some more interest which is something which is absolutely essential and um, we have countries where huge progress have been made I mean we're in Switzerland I mean it's a typical country where the number of accidents have decreased drastically over the last decades so in uh, developed countries and it's starting from a government decisions, the problem has been addressed. Unfortunately, as it was mentioned earlier, in developing countries, which does represent most of where the accidents are happening, the problem has not yet been properly addressed. And that's what we all need to do with every single means Together, we must see how each government in the developing countries are going to address the problem of road safety. And it is a society effort. It's a global effort which has really to start. Scott, what role do you think the private sector can help play in advancing these dialogues at the political level, globally, or at the, at the country level? Well, um, you know, Jean raises some really important issues of how we need multi-sectoral engagement. And when I hear Malcolm's number that 80% of deaths and accidents are due to distractions, we have to figure out and take those distractions apart. You know, how many of them are due to texting or phone-oriented? How many are due to sleep deprivation, over-the-counter drugs, prescription drugs, alcohol, illicit drugs, whatever it might be? 
and start to take it down in ways that we can then figure out how do we communicate with those people, as Ava's suggesting, focusing on prevention, focusing on things that can be done from the behavioral side, but also at the same time, prevention works when it's enforced. When seatbelts were first introduced in these cars years ago, they in and of themselves did not save lives. The passenger had to use the seatbelt, they had to be reminded to use the seatbelt, they had to be also reminded that there is a law to use the seatbelt, and then they had to have enforcement that if they broke the law, then you started to see the change and the curve went down. Similar innovations have also happened with airbags, similar innovations of course with the way the car has the regulatory pieces and so forth. But doing all of that doesn't just happen from a regulatory framework and then it changes people's behavior. We have new ways of communicating with people that frankly are mostly private sector driven. When you think about social media, we wouldn't even use the term. We didn't have the term maybe 20, 30 years ago. We had social networks, but now we have ways that with Facebook, 1.2 billion people can be reached. Uh, we have other ways that multimedia channels are there. So what we've been trying to do is try to figure out ways that how do we get to people at times when they are making appropriate decisions. And we sell beer. People buy beer in sporting events. Uh, we have changed the way they can buy beer in sporting events so they uh, will not be able to get that and will not be intoxicated by the time he or she would get behind the wheel. Or we've also had alternatives that they would get free uh, mass transit home or other mechanisms and so forth. We've tried to instigate ideas of designated drivers, but there's new things that could happen. So I think that the answer is, is that no one sector alone can do this. It's, it's too complex these days. And working with uh, the associations, with FIA, and with others that have networks of people that understand uh, the challenges, but also understand all the different assets that we have together, then I think we can actually begin to have the behavior change in the movement, as we call it, to bend the curve. And I'm taking that from both an epidemiology standpoint, right? We want to bend the curve. If we're going to this fifth leading cause of death, we want to make it go downwards. But we also need to straighten out the roads. We have to figure out the ways of making the world a safer place that we all live in. Great. I'm going to ask one more question before we open it up to the audience. And, and Malcolm, it's to you. You mentioned the stats around the mix of road accidents in the developing world versus higher income countries. You know, we've seen the mobile phone as a technology to help many countries leapfrog kind of steps in development. Are there any technologies that you see on the horizon that might enable countries to leapfrog the steps in safety? Yes. Um as you said, uh, mobile phones has, has really changed uh, the way people live, especially in the developing world. Uh, in fact, uh, the growth in mobile phones in Africa is the highest in anywhere in the world. Um, and um, the reason that uh, we've seen that growth in that technology and in the future technologies, the new uh, mobile systems coming along like LTE, uh, which offers uh, much better quality and coverage, um, is the key to it is that we have a common uh, use of spectrum. If you don't have the common use of spectrum throughout the world, you haven't got the economies of scale. Um, and uh, this is obviously a challenge. You know, we have 193 uh, member states in ITU come together every four years. They have to agree on the um, use of the spectrum on a worldwide basis so that we can have uh, commonly allocated and harmonized bands for these different technologies. And that's quite a challenge to get all uh, these countries to come together every four years and sign an international treaty at the end of that conference on how they're going to use that spectrum. Um, but it's been a very successful, especially on uh, the mobile phones. But now we need to identify spectrum for intelligent transport systems. For example, in-car radar uh, to avoid, uh, for collision avoidance. Um, so th these um, uh, issues will be on the agenda for the next uh, World Radio Conference next year. And uh, industry plays a big part in, in driving these conferences and com coming together and agreeing on the use of the spectrum because they, they're the main uh, users. So we would encourage also um, industry to, to put participate in the preparations for this World Conference. And as Scott says, it's, it's bringing all these different actors together. I mean, InBev, it's really great that InBev is taking the, you know, this initiative to come together with FIA, UNECE, 
with all the other players that will be participating in these two days. And that's the real challenge, is to bring all the players together and to collaborate together. Excellent. Well, I've got many more questions, but I know folks in the audience do as well. Uh, so let's turn to the audience for a few questions. I believe we have mics roving. I would like to come back to the ambivalence of technology, distraction on one side, on one end. And as Oleg said, technology innovation, and thanks to FIA, by the way, and the way FIA has been able to, uh, to test, to demonstrate new technologies, Oleg mentioned uh, safety belts, but electronics have bring a lot of prevent, not preventive, uh, passive safety with airbags, with uh, uh, automotive operating systems, moving to more active safety is with electronic stability control, and now anti-collision systems coming. And of course, the most important step is next one, prevention. And this is where we all hoped, and for the past eight years, Malcolm, we have collaborated to uh, your workshops because we have been convinced that technology could bring more in prevention. Great. Now, I have a question to Jean vis-a-vis -vis, uh, in electronics, you have been really uh, making in action the power of reducing pollution, increasing the, the efficiency of the engine, the powertrain, and now moving to uh, F1E, I mean electric propulsion. In the area of safety, do you think that the amount of R&D being spent today towards the so-called autopilot, autonomous car, is really uh, done uh, wisely towards increasing the safety of the vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure, or is it a kind of defocus versus you know, accelerating integrated safety systems, you know, again, ESP, anti-collision avoidance systems, and of course, car-to-car -car and car-to-infrastructure communication further, as Malcolm said, more rapidly, rather than you know, dreaming at the autonomous car. Great. So Jean What's Jean, your you position to toward this start with that? effort in technology? I mean, definitely, over the last decade, some amazing progress have been uh, achieved. And I, I will take probably the most uh, simple one, which is a safety belt. You know, I mean, safety belts 30 years ago, nobody knew what was a safety belt. And then when they started to know what it was, they did not want to use it. Uh, and now in developed countries, I mean, safety belt, I mean, nobody will dare to get into the car without putting a safety belt. But that's in developed countries. Developing countries are far behind. I mean, developing countries, they don't know what is a safety belt yet, you know. So we must always bear in mind that we have two huge differences. What is happening in developing countries where we have the development of new technologies, which is fascinating. I mean, behind you, you have one car in the Geneva Motor Show. I mean, you have amazing cars with all those new technologies. And uh, I mean, one of the latest new technology which you just mentioned was ESC, electronic stability control. I mean, electronic stability control is a very strong driver head. And in European countries, it is mandatory. So now you cannot buy a car without ESC. Maybe what you could, you could regret is that it's not enough information about it. You know, I think when you buy a car, you should know what you have available in your car. And unfortunately, not often you have the awareness of your attention about what you have available and what it does make. And uh, you have sensational new technologies which uh, are arriving. And uh, of course, it's always a counter effect because it is true that uh, all those uh, new technologies uh, like uh, texting and all that, and even using the GPS, using the GPS, which is uh, amazing facilities to know where you are. But I mean, it diverts your attention, you know? So I mean, GPS can be 
a killer if it is not properly monitored. So on, on all those new technologies, you need to have also a very specific uh, attention. But definitely, you know, in the, in the best world, with the new technologies which, we are, which will be available, and if they are used properly, definitely it will have one amazing effect on accident. Not only the people who drive their car or who drive their motorbike or their bicycle, but also for all the people who are behind, like the pedestrian. You must not forget that 25% of the word accident on the road are pedestrian. They have nothing to do, you know, with a, with a vehicle, but I mean, they have a victim of the vehicle. And definitely now you can easily allow a pedestrian to have access to new technologies. So he will know when a car is arriving. So all that is soon available, but the difficult thing is how to optimize the use of all those new technologies. Right. Great answer. Uh, Response yes, as well. One point on this: vehicle technologies need to be matched with infrastructure technologies, and infrastructure technologies are vastly lagging behind. This area hasn't received adequate attention. So maybe th for us in the UN, this is one of the areas where we are going to work much more. Because in the World Forum for uh, Harmonization of Vehicle uh, Regulations, the vehicle technologies are addressed. But for, for the infrastructure, we haven't done that in the parallel working group, SE1. So that's uh, coming up for us. Great, great. Another question from the audience? Yes. Good, mo good morning, Bernard de Gerdil from Friscale Semiconductor. I will speak in terms of a standardization person. In the standardization for the last five to 10 years for ITS, we've done a lot of effort in uh, ITUT, ISO, SIE, Atripoli, <coughs> ETSI, and for, uh, to standardize vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure. Today, the release one is finished. We've done a lot of interoperability. There is a large project like Corridor in Germany between Austria, Germany, Deutschland. In France, it's core F. In the US, there is a lot of vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle, uh, uh, deployment. But if I look in the heaven, we have a frequency, 5.9 gigahertz, but we don't see anything in the press. People completely ignore this vehicle-to-vehicle. -vehicle. And it's, it's opposite, because we have a special frequency at 5.9, and the, the person say, oh, maybe we can use this frequency for Wi-Fi and not for ITS. That means we have it in the opposite. If I look at uh, what's happened in the 3G, 4G, we already speak of 5G. No people know what will be 5G, but no people speak about 5G. That means we need marketing effort in terms of regulation. Because when we say, oh, people say, no, there is no business case. But two million of person is a good business case. Great. Do you have anyone else with a, with a question? Roger Lanto with Strategy Analytics. I'm curious if any of the speakers uh, have some thoughts about the role that insurance companies can play, because uh, to your point, uh, uh, regulatory authorities can apply mandates to uh, try to drive adoption of these technologies, but a market-driven approach might be more successful. I'm interested, someone mentioned insurance companies earlier, but then didn't say anything more, and I thought maybe the insurance companies could play a bigger role. Great, Scott, do you wanna start with that one? Uh, I'm smiling because when we were, I mentioned the Davos, the World Economic Forum for this meeting that we had on, on road safety, uh, the chairman of AIG was at our session, and before we even had the session, he was speaking on Bloomberg about the importance of ABM, BAV, AIG, and a number of other companies, including FIA and the UN, to get together to address this issue. And as the insurer who's doing a lot of training in particularly China and fleets and so forth, uh, AIG was very interested in how they could play a role in our coalition that we're discussing. The second piece is, is that not only the behavioral economics world, but being given, using the idea of computerized chips to actually monitor the kind of behavior of the driver that then the insurers can give both a carrot and a stick approach has already gone into effect. There's a number of different examples that are being used in United States, South Africa, around the world uh, to actually uh, monitor on a very simple basis 
Uh, I think this is something that will work out quite well. We've seen it. We've actually worked with Honda in Brazil for our, motor, our motorcycles that are uh, delivering uh, beer, that we're also making certain that these people are driving appropriately and uh, also within the ways that try to reduce accidents. There's all sorts of unique ways to think about technologies. And partners such as insurers that obviously uh, have a large amount of, shall we say, skin in the game in some countries and others where they're very highly uh, mandated uh, could very well be one of the key interlocutors. And I'm, I'm really happy that, that Ava brought it up as an important partner. And um, we're happy that uh, we have the kind of engagement and the kind of thinking that's necessary to, to reach people at the time of need. Great. I'm going to close with one last question because we're almost out of time. Quick one uh, for each of you. If you had one wish to help improve road safety, what would that wish be? Scott, do you want to start? Oh, I'm, I'm going first. So. <laughs> uh, you know, I like to live in the world of innovation, uh, the world of when we go from what I say from the, as a medical doctor who's been in academics, where we always look at what are the best practices and then how do we scale those. I think technology is making us move from best practices to next practices. And when I was doing some innovation uh, with the United Nations of an innovation working group on women and children's health, the piece that we locked on to the most uh, was the idea of the mobile phone. With five billion people having health within an arm's reach with the mobile phone, we think there's also the opportunity to say within arm's reach or within uh, whether they're walking, uh, whether they're uh, any type of transportation, there's an opportunity for technology to make a difference in their lives. Mm -hmm. And my vision, my hope would be, and we didn't, we didn't have words such as Google and Facebook and uh, designated driver even you know, when I was first born. Uh, we need to come up with something that's new, that's something that links all of those things together and puts us in a framework where we have bent the curve we have made a difference, and we have done this all together and make the society better for our children and our children's children. So my vision is we will be there. We'll be there with innovation, technology is an enabler, and all of us in this room are responsible for how we get there. Great. Ava, one wish? Well, one wish, increase professionalism. Um, but I would like to come back to insurance because that's extremely important. Number one, if a crash happens, we need to mitigate a negative impact. One element is the health, trauma care. The other one is insurance. In many countries, insurance is not there. So basic insurance is needed. The other aspect, what actually you have raised, is much more about new technologies. And you know, we have a huge debate about liability. Uh, we hear a lot that the driver should stay responsible no matter what technology is there. Now, drivers may not create the demand for automation if they have to stay responsible. So we have a huge issue. That is a question of consistency between the Vienna Conventions and the vehicle regulations. We are addressing it, but at a slow speed because uh, we have to raise some, uh, some assistance, some funding to do more research in this area. So definitely, this is a big task. But Wish, not vision. That's a different thing. Wish, increase professionalism. Great. Uh, jean todd one wish. I mean, for me, it's one clear wish. You know, we have the post-2015 SDG sustainable, sustainable Development Goal, and I really wish that the government will decide, the G20 will decide to include that among the priority for the future. And without that, it will not work. Very tangible. And final remarks, Malcolm, one wish. Well, my wish would be that uh, the estimates of how much uh, this technology can uh, reduce deaths on the road, the estimate of 80% is going to come true, and it's going to come true very quickly. And uh, I think uh, I've, we've heard how important it is that we have all the various stakeholders coming together. And I think this event uh, has shown that uh, we're working quite successfully towards that end and that we can bring this technology to the benefits of all the people in the world and especially the developing world and we can raise the potential of this technology in the developing world where the majority of these deaths and injuries are occurring. Thank you for the, the optimistic note to end on. Thank you again to all of the panelists and for the audience members for joining us this morning. Have a great day. <laughs>